its own ID, simply made by creating and hashing everything together. And, uh, and then it has the previous box ID as well. So if you were going to change an existing blockchain, you basically got to change a lot of things on how it's calculating. Plus, you got to change every box after that because you got to recalculate all the blocks. Um, like, so we go, to that, go into that in detail. Uh, we go into like hash values in detail in the first, uh, first course as well. Basically, you know, how hash values work. I think a lot of you guys probably, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, what I saw in the course, probably know how hash values work. If you don't, if I'm going too fast for you, please, please let me know. But uh, like I said, we've covered all this in the first, first course. I want to get into kind of the meat of this is the Ethereum blockchain because we did not cover this in the first course. So, uh, so Ethereum is like, uh, like like the uh, like the Bitcoin blockchain, but Ethereum was actually created to uh, really have applications in the blockchain. So uh, so Ethereum, like I said, um, you know it's its own blockchain. It has characteristics of the blockchain. Uh, it has nodes on a blockchain, just like the blo uh, Bitcoin blockchain that has. Uh, but uh, like I said, its main function was actually to create an application. When Ethereum first came into play, it wasn't there to compete with Bitcoins in any way. It actually, the creators actually thought that it was going to complement Bitcoins. But because of the way cryptocurrencies have taken off, and because the most popular application of Ethereum is the Ether cryptocurrency, it's kind of become a competitor to uh, Bitcoins. And then, of course, the Bitcoin foundations are like, Man, we need to like change some of our stuff to compete with Ethereum, so they've kind of become competitors. But for the most part, it was never really meant to be that way. Um, uh, so the blockchain was really good, designed to take the innovations beyond cryptocurrency. They're like Bitcoins; they do cryptocurrency really well. We want to do other stuff. All right. Uh, it was really there to you know be tamper-proof financial contracts, and um, and basically it was powered by the Ethereum Ether cryptocurrency that was like kind of the power behind that that was the driving force behind that but it wasn't there to like just add speculative or value to either just a currency that's what it does now yeah i know like people just invest in ethereum ethereum right now so uh so i know that's 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 why people uh, you know invest in ethereum right now but that's uh you know that wasn't always the case so, like I said, Ethereum was intended to, like, like I said, complement Bitcoin uh, like as a competitor, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but it wasn't, it was but it wasn't meant to be a competitor. So, let's look at the proof of work for Ethereum, uh, you know, and uh, what Ethereum does. But first of all, Ethereum, the, one of the biggest difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin is Bitcoin's like we have code, but that code is mostly like text. It basically is like what the what the, what the Bitcoin, like, you know, what, what the transaction is. With Ethereum, I can actually have executable code on, uh, you know, on, on, on the blockchain itself. Um, you, know, you know, Ethereum uses the hashing algorithm called eCash, e, e, e uh, so it works as SHA-256 for Bitcoins. Um, so uh, the, the proof of work uh, is going to be moving on Ethereum. We're, we're not going to be using proof of work going forward. They said that it's actually going to happen in 2022. It looks like it's probably going to happen in 2023. It's being tested right now. All the kinks haven't been worked out on what uh, you know how proof of stake is going to look like. But uh, but it's going to be proof of work instead of proof of stake. So what is proof of stake? We've talked about it. So we we talked about it as I said in uh, our last course. We talked quite a bit about um, what. Uh, what uh, you know, proof of uh, work is. I'm sorry, I got a, got a question coming in. Let me see what that is. Okay, we're we're good there. All right, so I apologize. Someone, uh, a couple of people said they lost. They couldn't hear me for a, a little bit, and looks like we're okay now. Uh, once again, if that happens, please just go ahead and refresh your refresh your screen. Hopefully, um, hopefully that'll work. But let's talk about proof of stake. We've talked like quite a bit about what proof of work is. We've kind of gone over that as well as. Uh, as well as uh, you know, in our first course, uh, so like proof of uh, stake is a new way of basically uh, like uh, getting rid of like uh, you're trying to make it more environmentally friendly. So proof of stake basically, uh, you know, cryptocurrency owners are validating uh, the block by using stake coins, and I'm going to explain that in a second. So while um, while proof of work, basically what it, what it does is it basically rewards miners for solving cryptographic puzzles. And those miners basically solve cryptographic puzzles by using computing power. What proof of state does is it basically says like, instead of like miners solving like, uh, you know, uh, problems using cryptographic 
puzzles. What we're going to do is we're going to have like you know uh, people put in stake coins. They're basically going to put in coins into like the central authority, and uh, we're we're going to pick someone. We're going to pick one person to essentially um, you know solve the problem. Basically, one, one, so instead of everyone, all these computers around the world solving like a block, we're going to have like one entity solve a block instead. So that way, we're not you know we're not wasting all this computing power, right? We're not having like people just like run computing power and competing because you could have like you know a hundred thousand people running like computers, but if only one computer you know solves a problem, whoever solves a problem first. Everyone else is kind of like you know wasted that computing power. So we're gonna say basically we're we're not going to do that. We're gonna only like give one person the opportunity to solve the problem. So um, so basically uh, the blockchain chooses like whoever is going to solve the problem at random. Like for, it's not always random, but, but but basically like whoever has a larger stake position usually has more of a chance of solving the problem. So if I if uh, you know you know say if I stake a uh, hundred uh, hundred coins and you stake a thousand coins, well you have ten times more chance of being chosen to solve the the block than I do. Uh, it doesn't mean that you will always solve the block, but it just means your chances are great. It's a, it's kind of like the NBA draft, right? Uh, it's a, so so you you'll you'll be chosen more likely to solve a problem, and when you're chosen more likely to solve a problem, that means that you get the reward and I don't, right? But when when I when I'm not chosen, I'm not computing anything, I'm not doing anything. My computer's basically sitting idle, right, at that point. So it's only the people, only the computer that's that's chosen. To solve the problem, I think I probably need to do some sort of animation or graphing on this to make it a little easier. But hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Like I said, a proof of stake doesn't have miners for the most part. They don't have miners. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have validators instead. We call them validators, not miners. And like I said, uh, basically an algorithm is used to pick a random validator to verify the block. So uh, so like I said, what what happens is think of like a big bank. Think of like a lot of people going to a bank and they're making deposits into this bank. These deposits are called like proof of stake, like stake coins. Right? Do you have a minimum number of coins to stake? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it depends on the blockchain. Like for Ethereum, the minimum number of coins is twenty coins to to stake. Uh, at least that's what's being discussed right now. That's probably going to be the standard when uh, when Ethereum two point gets migrated over. Other blockchains have their different rules, but it looks like Ethereum is probably going to be twenty coins. Uh, with quantum computing, can we see 20 million uh, coins uh, mined in our lifetime? So we we don't know, right? I mean, I mean, m there, there, m most people are saying no because there is a built-in delay, right? Uh, so first of all, there's a built-in delay and with a halving and the built-in delay. So um, to mine a block in Bitcoins, it doesn't matter how much computing power you have. There, there is a built-in delay of 10 minutes. And so because of that, we know every 10 minutes how long it's going to take to mine 210,000 blocks right so uh, so so we just do that math together so it doesn't matter like uh, because obviously computing power is getting um, much faster and better and more efficient every day and um, but it doesn't matter like it took 10 minutes 10 years ago to like uh, you know mine uh, mine a block and it takes 10 minutes right now that built in delay is part of the the bitcoin protocol and uh, and uh, if, if computing power increases basically that proof of work uh, you know algorithm that difficulty increases in fact the more people that join the network, the difficulty increases exponentially. Uh, but but it's always kind of geared towards staying around about ten minutes. It's not it's not always exactly, but it's about ten minutes. And so we know, uh, um, you, you, you know, you know, we know we know the predictability. Could things like drastically change with quantum computing? Yeah, absolutely, they could. But 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 uh, uh, theoretically, that should still be built in. So even with quantum computing, uh, you know, we should still have a ten minute delay because the proof of work is going to increase exponentially by the computing power everyone moves in. All right. So uh, like I said, uh, you know, you know, there's no miners. There's validators out there. Validators put put stake coins in basically. And those uh, state coins uh, basically think of, like I said, think of a lot of people going to the same bank. They're making deposits into the bank. Uh, that, that, that deposit is called stake coins. And the more, the bigger your balance is, the more likely you're you're going to be chosen as a validator. So, like I said, a, a validator has deposited a minimum number of coins. Uh, and like so, in Ethereum, it's Ether coins or Ether tokens, and we call these stake tokens. Um, so, like I said, for the Ethereum network, at least right now, 
uh, the number is 20. There is this idea of validated pools. I don't think that's going to be like uh, like in the final like um, you know version of uh, Ethereum, but like other other blockchains will probably have validated pools as well. So say I only have one coin, I want to team up with like you know twenty other people that have or nineteen other people that have one coin, I may be able to do that. But what happens if I uh, you know team up with like a thousand people or ten thousand people? Then all of a sudden I'm kind of making an unfair advantage of the network, uh, you know, because uh, you know once again pools could kind of dictate everything, and then one of the problems this proof of stake was trying to solve is making sure that you don't have pools and you don't have like you, you know uh, entities controlling these large numbers. So, um, so I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, it, does, it, it hasn't been fully decided, but it looks like kind of the consensus is from uh, people like like that are looking at this is probably pools are not going to be allowed. So that means there has to be some sort of investment. They are talking about like hey, they're, they're, they're talking about some other alternative solutions on what to do. Like if you don't have twenty coins, you know how you can have other people kind of invest but it's the same it's you know the the argument the counter argument is it's kind of like bitcoins right i mean if you're if you don't have like a lot of investment in bitcoins if i just have one computer with bitcoins i'm just kind of wasting i'm never going to really get any rewards i'm just kind of wasting a lot of computing power and uh you know i'm going to get pennies on the dollar if anything so there's no really any point to it and the people are saying kind of the same thing as if someone doesn't have 20 coins you know do we really want to give them the you, you know the um opportunity to participate or not and of course people are like well that's not fair you're kind of favoring the rich uh other things like of that nature so um there's a lot of our arguments and counter arguments so remember it's not perfect by any means um but, but like i said the more you have at stake the the greater your chances are and just keep in mind like i said when final versions of everything comes out will we'll, you know things may change uh, so people like say, well, okay, is proof of stake fair? Like, like because, like, uh, I mean, what about if I'm like a millionaire, or what about if I've just invested really or gone lucky, and I have like, you know, I have a hundred thousand coins or ten thousand coins or something like that, that I can just stake a lot, lot in there, and uh, you, you know, you know, I'll, I'll probably be chosen more likely than other people to basically be a validator, and that means that I validate coins and I get a reward. So basically, the rich get richer, right? And uh, and that's. Uh, you know, you know, and people complaining that well, that's not fair. That like favors the wealthy, and it just makes the rich get richer. Uh, actually, studies have shown at least uh, that that it actually may be more fair than proof of work. And why is that? Well, because like the cost of electricity, by the way, doesn't increase linearly. Like because of econ economies of scale, like. Guess what? The more you buy in bulk, like the better the discounts you get, right? Uh, it, it's the same thing as if I if I if I go to a data center and I have one computer. You know, I may be paying like seventy dollars a month, but uh, like if I have like like uh, like hundreds of computers, right? I may be paying like um, seven thousand a month, but 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 like if I, but that that could be a lot cheaper. Like if I do it individually at data centers, it could be like ten thousand, but because I'm buying in bulk, I'm buying an entire rack at a time. It could be a lot cheaper. It's kind of the same thing. Economies of scale basically mean that the more you spend, uh, like uh, the, like that's why the larger miners right now. Like make money. That's why like you have like companies and corporations that are essentially buying buildings and like uh, you know shipping containers and just making those into data centers because of uh, economies of scale. And pretty much, if you're not in a pool, if you're by yourself or you're not like a large corporation, you're not really making any money with uh, with um, you know mining. I, I tell people if you want to make money with mining, um, uh, you know you know uh, just uh, uh, basically buy it and like you know you know buy the coins. You're not gonna be able to do that. Um, so are, are there pools of users that have less than 20, 20 uh, Ethereum? Um, yes, yes, they are. But are they, are they going to be in the final version of when Ethereum goes to 2.0? Probably not, not on the Ethereum network. Maybe on other networks and other blockchains, right? I mean, so on the Flare blockchain, on uh, uh, you know, uh, some other blockchains, they are talking about that. But it looks like, you know, it's being discussed on the Ethereum blockchain for sure, but it looks like it's probably not going to make it. So it looks like if you want to be, Ethereum blockchain, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to have 20 20 Ethereum to stake. Um, so validators, by the way, um, if you're a single validator, like one of the powers of like proof of work is that everyone has a copy of the blockchain. Everyone is validating the blockchain on their own. So you have multiple people like validating the blockchain on their own. They're basically computing all those hashes on their own as well. And so it's very hard to do fraud. But if you have a single validator. You have this opportunity for fraud to happen. 
So uh, the way like they kind of combat, combat this is basically um, the, the 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 money that you stake into uh, in, into uh, your your central authority basically. Ethereum is always higher than what the fees and the transaction costs are going to be. So your reward is always going to be less than what your stake is. So you have an opportunity to lose your stake. If you do something incorrectly, you're going to lose your stake. And um, basically, this is relying on like capitalism and and uh, and uh, uh, you know to uh, basically guarantee, or at least uh, the hope is to guarantee that um, you know people uh, will not do fraud, fraudulent blocks because. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Like if you if you already stake 20, 20 coins, you you have a lot, like a large investment. You probably have investments outside your your stake coins as well. So you could lose all that. And if you do have fraud, basically people are going to lose trust in the system, and uh, and the market's going to crash. So so the idea is that you know no one's going to be self destructive, and want, no one's going to want to cause the world on fire. Does that mean like you could have absolutely someone self destructive and doesn't care and just wants to burn it? Like a like you know this uh like crazy billionaire that decides like you know what I don't care I'm I'm gonna burn everything and I'm gonna put the world on fire yeah you could have that but the system's really designed to basically uh, make it financially uh, you know <laughs> displeasing for anyone that that does that so that's that's really uh, kind of the control that's put in there so if you decide like you know what I'm not gonna be a validator anymore. Um, you, you, you know, your stake and your rewards are re- released, so you don't get your rewards right away. You don't get your stake coins right away. There's, there's actually some time, and it depends on the blockchain, but, like, you know, so, sometimes it, this can be, uh, you know, they're talking about, like, up to a year in some cases before you get your money back. So there is definitely an, an investment out there, and that's because, you know, they want to make sure, first of all, uh, like, you haven't done any fraud. So if transactions are verified after the fact that, uh, you know, the, you, your stake can still be taken away, Um and uh, so, uh, and and who determines that? That's uh, you know, you know, how is that validated? That's that's still kind of up to the standard, and that's still being uh, you know discussed right now. But uh, but essentially, that that is the reason why, or that's the kind of the gotcha method of like keeping things fair. So there's this idea of a fifty one percent attack. So in uh, in uh, in proof of work, the the idea is if you have or. 51% of the computing power, uh, you could uh, potentially, like, you know, manipulate the proof of work and do, like, things like double spending and control the network, right? Um, a, mo- most people think it doesn't happen on a, a, you know, you know, on a cryptocurrency because essentially, like, you know, if someone finds out about the 51% attack or you do have more than 51% of the computing power, um, no one's going to trust the system and the value is going to tank. But once again, it's, it's kind of self-policing. Um, the fifty-one percent attack is absolutely, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, possible on proof of stake as well, because you could have over fifty-one percent of all the stake coins. But um, it's much more impractical to do that. You think about it: the Bitcoin market cap is four hundred and thirty-eight billion. Um, the, the Eastern Hand market cap is one hundred and ninety billion. You know, you know, even if like a small percentage of people like uh, like handle proof of stake. Um, you're talking about someone like basically staking billions of dollars. So, so uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, there's some sort of like stake for, uh, you know, built-in stake for everyone on Bitcoin. You're, I mean, I mean, it's going to be impossible. No, no, no one's going to be staking billions of dollars and putting that at risk. You know, to uh, to basically have 51 percent of the market, right? Because they're going to lose their investment, their value is going to go down, and they're going to have to put in a, a lot of stake coins. So, it basically makes it really impractical. Um, so um, we also don't know the problems like proof of uh, work stake is going to do. Proof of work's been around a long time. Like I said, the Bitcoin proof of work was pretty well thought out, and we kind of have avoided a lot of problems. But Ethereum in the past has had problems with proof of work, so we don't know all the problems like proof of stake is going to have, right? And that's that, that's an issue. Sometimes we, we we'll, I think we're going to have to implement it to kind of figure out what that problem is going to be. Also. Um, the algorithms need to be constructed very carefully on picking the next validator. So, like, if you, you know, if you have the most stake coins and you have a, you know, 10% more chance than everyone else of being the validator, what happens on the next block? Are you the validator again? What happens on the next block? Are you the validator again? Like, uh, that's not fair either. So, like, the algorithms, although they use, like, you know, whoever has the most stake coins as a, as a big part of, uh, like, how to pick the validator, it doesn't mean that has to be the only part. So they're looking at other methods on how to do that. There's things like, uh, like uh, you know, it can't be just a number of state coins. Uh, like CoinAge could be a method that's one proposal. Like 
like you, you know, like will age out the coins that you've used as a validator. So, so once once you're picked as a validator, your stake coins basically, um, you know, you know, can't be used again again for that stake coins for maybe another uh, hundred blocks or twenty blocks or something like that. So, so there's uh, there's all these proposals that are coming out. Like, how do we make this more fair than just the number of stake coins? Um, how are backup validators chosen? So, what happens if a validator doesn't respond? What happens if a validator is not available? Uh, if a validator withdraws or it's just taking too long, what, what, about, what, what about like something happens to the computing environment and what happens in that case? So how are backup validators chosen? All this stuff is still really being discussed. There's a, like I said, there's a number of proposals out there, but there's things that, that need to be uh, thought about. And as I said, it has like a lot of risks that we just don't know about. We don't know what we don't know. Right? We've kind of gone through years and years of proof of state and proof of work. We haven't gone through that same due diligence for proof of stake. There's a lot of smart people thinking about the mass, thinking about like all the possibilities that are out there, but uh, you know, you know, we don't know exactly what that is. Um, so Casper is kind of the method, it's kind of the code name for Ethereum uh, 2.0. It's like the method that's being used for uh, proof of stake in Ethereum. Like I said, it's not on the Ethereum main network right now. It's only on the test networks right now. Uh, so, uh, so that's where we're going. I just want to cover a couple of other things real fast. So Hyperledger is another type of blockchain. It's it's basically from the Linux Foundation. It's uh, it's also getting really popular for like smart contracts and for business solutions as well. Uh, it it is not it is not exactly like a blockchain that has a lot of the blockchain ca characteristics. Um, so the purpose of a Hyperledger is uh, you know versus Ethereum. Like I said, Ethereum and Hyperledger are kind of two two different types of technologies, uh, you know, one's uh, based on distributed uh, ledger technology um, with a customized blockchain app. So it's really meant for, Hyperledger was really meant for enterprises and for businesses. So everything that I'm talking about, if you want to do it privately, like Ethereum is all public, but like say privacy is important to you, uh, you're like, you know what, I don't really want my stuff out there. I don't want everyone querying the blockchain. I don't want like people like going to Easter scan and like picking up my stuff like, uh, like, uh, you know, things personally, they, they, they do that. I move things. I actually have multiple uh, things that are set up. It's a little more complicated than, you know, to explain in the course of this class. But I will move things from the Ethereum blockchain to my own personal hyperledger that I have hosted on, like, on a cloud-based environment. So um, there, there, there's things of that nature. Um, let me just see. It looks like. One second here. So uh, one of the questions is like, what uh, what features do I look for in a in an NFT project? Um, this sounds bad, but I, I really it's really my gut feeling that I look for. I'm I'm uh, you know I'm 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 definitely being on like the. NFT, like I, I follow it quite a bit, and to be honest with you, I, I'm I'm also sometimes like on the mix. I'm like, why is this digital art worth so much money? So I, I kind of go on a lot of speculative decisions. Like I've done really well for myself, like uh, doing that, but I, I don't, you know, I don't really find too much value. Like I don't fall in love. I, I've, just, I've just never been the kind of person that falls in love with like a piece of digital art. Like yeah, I do. I really do like like looking at paintings and physical things. Like I, I, I still enjoy that. I'm, I like like touching like a, like a, you know. You know, I'm still the kind of person that would like to read a book instead of like a, a digital book and stuff like that. So so I'm not the the best person to ask, but I, like what I do is I do things feel like things that I can turn over pretty fast, and I feel like things that are like trending in value. So so my, like my my holdings for most of my NFT projects is like a pretty pretty short amount of time because I'm trying to kind of just make a profit real fast and I'm trying to like play around with things real fast. It's, it's also a way that I personally do learning as well. So, so first of all, if you're the owner, so the question was, if I'm the owner of a picture, how can I sell the NFTs? Well, well, you probably can't. You probably don't have the legal right to, right? Because, uh, because uh, you don't own that picture. You don't own the you, the copyright of that picture. So you probably don't have the legal right to. But let's say you you've painted and created your own picture. You know, how can you sell the NFT to that? Well, some, well, you have to create an NFT. So you'd have to create a smart contract. You would have to use alchemy or something like that. And you'd have to in your contract, you know, put some sort of identifier in that contract that's tied to that that picture itself. Maybe you have a marking on that picture or some signature on that picture or something that's 
unique on that picture that's tied basically that's referenced in your NFT. So that would be the that would be the way to start. I think that's what you're asking. All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you for following me on Twitter. Yeah, so so uh, so uh, and and I know you guys can't can't all see the questions, um, but but uh, but I'm just looking at the questions in the Q and A chat. Um, so, uh, uh, so so yes, uh, you know, proof of stake is I wouldn't say it's cheaper than proof of work, but it's definitely more 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 environmentally friendly, more sustainable. Uh, I mean, people are saying it is cheaper. I mean, right now it seems like it's cheaper. I don't know if that's just because of the way we are right now, but, uh, you know, computing power is going to get cheaper right now, but it definitely is more more sustainable, I would say. Um, uh, so uh, how large in gigabytes or petabytes is the blockchain currently? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, the Ethereum blockchain is about like 900, uh, you know, 980 uh 80 gigabytes, uh, you know, Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, I think it was a, it was like about three or four gigs. Um, so uh, it doesn't take that much room for blockchain. Remember, it's like pretty much text. That that's what's in there uh, right now. Everything's an algorithm or text, so it doesn't take uh, that much. Um, you, you know, size for the blockchain. Uh, the IBM Ledger is owned by IBM. Uh, Hyper Ledger itself is basically open source. That's run by the Linux Foundation. Uh, so two different ledgers out there, two different purposes that are out there. Both hyper IBM is really geared towards uh, enterprises like the healthcare industry. Um, hyper ledgers are kind of being uh, introduced in a lot of different things. All right, so uh, Ethereum, as I said, like, kind of like some of the key differences with Ethereum is that it's a public network; everyone can have access to it. Hyper ledger. It, it, it's your own. It's basically your own code. You can run it anywhere you want. You can do anything you want with it. Um, it, it can be completely confidential. You can have access very, very limited to uh, what uh, hyperledgers are. Uh, uh, you, you can have uh, basically authentication. You can configure it any way you want. You can make your application any way you want. With Ethereum, you are relying on whatever the Ethereum like basically. Uh, you know, organization has said like what the rules for Ethereum are. Uh, with Hyperledger, it's flexible. Yeah, it's it's like writing open source software or manipulating open source software. Is you can kind of make your own. You can dictate what your own uh, your access is going to be on that. So Ethereum, like I said, right now it uses proof of work. It is going to go to proof of stake, but it uses proof of work right now. That's that's the main idea of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Hyperledger. Uh, with, uh, I mean, with Ethereum, with Hyperledger, by the way, is uh. Uh, it, it, there's not, there's no real like concept of proof of work because there's no, um, it, there's no real reason for uh, like uh, basically, basically if you use Hyperledger, you're using it in your own company and you already know the people you're going to do business with. And, like you're you're not going to make it open to the public. Uh, you're going to have a you're already going to have a clo- close relationship with whoever you're going to do business with, right? So if you're a company A, like uh, you're going to have a relationship, a business relationship with another company, or another organization, or your customers. You already know who they are, so there's no reason to validate them, right? You probably have other methods on how you're doing business to validate if they're doing fraud or not, right? So, uh, so there's like, so it relies on like kind of higher level um, protocols or higher level business uh, goals to like kind of detect fraud. So there's no, there's no real reason. Think about a contract, like, like uh, you could, you, you can use a hyperledger for a contract, right? Uh, if I do a contract, like if I'm buying a, a piece of land or a house, right? Um, I already have like a relationship with a person that I'm buying things from. I'm going to get a physical property. So if I do things on a hyperledger, I don't need to like have like a network validate if that's correct or not, right? Because I'm going to get the deed to the property, other things as well. So, uh, so a hyperledger, you know, it's almost think of hyperledger as a new way of doing a DocuSign or something like that, right? It's essentially what that is. Um, it's kind of started that example right now. You already have that physical relationship versus proof of work. It could be like random people on the internet. So, so there's no real concept of uh, you know proof of work. You you could design your own proof of work in a hyperledger. It's it's open source. There's no reason why you couldn't, but uh, but it's just not really needed most of the time. Uh, you know, like I said, Ethereum is. Basically, permission free. Anyone can join. Like, if you have an internet connection, you can download software. You can start mining Ethereum or Ether coins. You can like join the network. There's no real like barrier to entry with Hyperledger. Like I said, my barrier to entry on my program is very different. Like, like if you want to like join my Hyperledger, I have to specifically grant you access. I have two factor authentication. I use Google Authenticator. Uh, you, you know, I have to know who you are, and I and I assign you very 
specific functions, whether you query my Hyperledger, whether you can update my Hyperledger, whether you can see updates or not. That's what I decide. Your Hyperledger may be completely different, right? Uh, if you run a Hyperledger for a supply chain, you, all your vendors may have access versus your accounting people may have different types of access. So, uh, um, uh, so, so uh, and I could hide, I could hide data. I could say, you know what? Um, uh, you know, my, my, my CFO can only see the financial data on how things cost between, uh, you know, my Hyperledger and supply chain versus everyone else can see that. Hyperledger also, remember, they're, they're, the Hyperledger is a generic term because it is open source, but I could take a Hyperledger and I can make it a Mars Hyperledger or you can make it like Jake's Hyperledger or, um, you know, John's Hyperledger. So, so you can have multiple Hyperledgers as a generic term, but it's also like a an outline that's made by the Linux Foundation, right? So with Ethereum, like, uh, like you know, Ethereum, like I said, most most people like don't, don't believe me or still kind of think it's like like impossible just because we talk so much about the cryptocurrency. But it was really made for smart contracts first. That that's what it was made for. It was made for smart contracts and uh, con and for conditions that get 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 automatically triggered. Like that example I gave you on the betting side. Uh, that's that's what Ethereum came up with. Um, it was powered by the Ether. Uh, you know, coin, that's like kind of like green game value. When we say powered by the Easter coin, that's what it gave like, people like, like, uh, you know, incentive and a stake to be in. Like, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to get some money out of this or I'm going to like have some rewards. I'm going to be penalized if I don't do things in a certain way. Um, so, uh, you, you, you know, uh, basically smart contracts, like I said, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you like, like from Hyperledger, um, they don't really have this uh, concept of like uh, like cryptocurrency built into them, and there's no reason for that. Like just like uh, you know, when you do a contract with a third party or in your business, you do. It's like sometimes you may have like a, a penalty if they don't fulfill the contract, but that's really up to you. That's really up to like how you're gonna design that. With a hyperledger, you could design something like saying like, hey, you know what, we are gonna fund this by Ethereum or Ether or Bitcoins or whatever you want. Or maybe you you don't fund this. Maybe your maybe your incentive is if they don't fulfill the terms of the contract, you you terminate the contract. Um, Wow, one second here, guys. All right, so uh, so when you're writing when, when you're writing smart contracts, like I said, uh, Solidity is basically used in uh, uh, you, you know in uh, uh, in uh, Ethereum, uh, while uh, while other uh, other contracts use. Uh, uh, you, you know, you can use other programming languages, but Solidity is like what's mostly used. And Hyperledger Go is kind of like the most uh, most popular uh, popular term right now. Hold on, one second, you guys. Hello, it's Solidity, but you don't. There's no reason you're limited to just that. I have written smart contracts in Python quite a bit. That I actually enjoy writing it in Python. I just like work really well on that. But uh, you, you know, for compatibility reasons, for other reasons, like if you're going to write something on the public blockchain, you probably won't use Solidity because that's what most people use. With Go, uh, with Hyperledger, it's just got geared towards Go, I would say. But most people don't uh, don't really even. Care because it's like completely private, right? So unless unless there's a compatibility issue with like some third parties or something, I'm not gonna really really care about that. Just to finish up real fast, I really want to show tell, tell you about uh, you know some some third party blockchains that are coming out that are we believe are going to be really popular for NFTs and for um, for smart contracts. Um, so uh, uh, Corda, which is which was created by R3. It's funny because even on Corda's website, they say they're a blockchain and not a blockchain at the same time. People kind of argue if they're a blockchain or not because they have a lot of blockchain properties, but they, but but then they can override a lot of their properties from a central authority. So there's no uh, there's no mutual checking, there's no nodes or anything like that. Um, so uh, once again, uh, they feel like they can do this because uh, if you're going to use Corda, Corda, Corda is, you're only going to use them between known parties as well. Uh, you're not going to like really uh, use this between uh, uh, you know people that um, 
that you don't know is not going to be like a public blockchain. Um, so uh, Corda also has an enterprise version of the software. Their enterprise version of the software is actually pretty cool because it comes with a whole architecture. It comes with like firewalls or firewall recommendations, network recommendations, segmentation, uh, you know, uh, systems, how you can basically have node systems and segment those node systems. So you're not just buying like a blockchain or something like conceptual. You're actually buying like an entire infrastructure with computers and everything on it. Uh, and it's, it's also meant to be run privately, right? So it can be run very locally, privately. There's no, you don't have to run it in the cloud or you can run it in a private cloud. Um, as I said, it has a lot of blockchain features that it does, right? Like from like tamper proof and things like that, but you're all running it privately. And there's not this idea of sort of party uh, nodes. So, uh, so that, so, uh, you know, some people consider it not a real blockchain. It has no currency built in and there's no native currency that's not like Ether or Bitcoins or anything like that. So it doesn't, doesn't do any, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no money to lose in the validation as well. It's just like a, a contract. Like I said, once again, I see it, uh, more like as like a DocuSign or something like that. It has like a lot of strong security features just because of their way they sell it and the way they, uh, you know, make sure that it has to be implemented. It has a lot of, a lot of strong, uh, security features and because of the strong security features it is backed by a lot of financial markets and players and you know people like big banks like bank of america and other places like that intel i believe is another company so it has a lot of people that are actually backing up for a lot of contracts they feel like hey you know what we don't want to go all blockchain but this has like a lot of the benefits of blockchain but um you know we don't have that uh someone mentioned the ibm blockchain as well ibm blockchain was very very similar to to corda as well corda is probably like a little more well, no, I would say well known a little more like uh, getting a little more press right now than IBM Blockchain, but IBM Blockchain was really well in a kind of the same same way. IBM Blockchain really made its name for itself for also keeping privacy data as well, and uh, so so because of that, uh, it's being used in the healthcare markets quite a bit as well. Um, uh, so guard time, I believe this is like kind of the blockchain to watch uh, as well. I know we're coming up on time, so let me just finish up real fast. And so uh, it's basically made by the country of Estonia. They use this, by the way, for uh, like um, a lot of different things. They have a lot of uh, security guys and cryptographers behind this. I believe this is like very, very solid technology. I believe this is like something to really, really watch. Uh, they have like a lot of kind of certifications, like EU certifications, uh, certifications in the airline industry and automobile industry because they take security very, very seriously. Um, the data can be shared in real time. And it's based on the KSI blockchain. So guard time is like the application, but uh, the KSI blockchain is the power behind that. And Estonia is already using this for their national IDs, for their like driver's licenses, passports. Uh, they have visually.